Good morning. Well, how many of you are ready this morning to get messed up by the Word of God? Amen? Man, in a good way, right? In a good way. So, man, when we encounter the Word of God, it changes us. And so I hope that you are ki- uh, came today ready to be changed by the Word of God. So can we just open in a word of prayer? Lord God, we pray that you would change our hearts and our minds today. Lord, we give you this time, and we pray that you would just deconstruct any barriers, any obstacles, uh, any uh, distractions that we face today so that we can hear your voice and you can speak to us today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, as John mentioned, we are in the middle of a series called The Gospel Shapes, and we're talking about uh, how the gospel shapes the practical aspects of our lives, the things that we deal with and live with every day. And so to to really how, know how to apply this, we have to know the gospel first. So just a quick uh, definition of the gospel. When we talk about the gospel, we are talking about uh, God's work throughout all of human history to bring us back into a uh, relationship with Him. And even though we know that humanity has rebelled against God and sinned and kind of thrown that in His face, He has done everything He can throughout all of history to bring us back into relationship with Him. And he's gone to such great lengths to do this that he even sent his own son to die on the cross to take the penalty of our sin so that our sin can be erased and we can once again be worthy enough to be in relationship with God. And so this is kind of the general outline of what we know the gospel is. But when we understand the gospel, that is played out in our lives in so many different ways. If you really understand that, the, that truth and you believe that truth, it ought to radically transform our daily rhythms, who, how we live, who we are. And so today we get to talk about how the gospel shapes our hospitality. And we're going to take a look at that. Now, uh, as we get rolling, I just wanted to mention a couple resources for you uh, around the theme of hospitality that I've drawn some of this material from this morning. So these are a couple great books. One is uh, Next Door As It Is in Heaven, uh, looking at how uh, we can really impact our neighborhoods. And then the other one, which is a, a new book by Rosaria Butterfield, it's called The Gospel Comes with a House Key. I love that. And she talks, she really breaks down this concept of hospitality and connects it to the gospel. So if this is something you'd like to go a little bit deeper, these are a couple great resources. But I wanted to start this morning by just asking you the question, what comes to mind, think about this, what comes to mind when you hear the word hospitality? Now we know there's a a hospitality industry, right? That's like restaurants and hotels and you can get a degree in that and go into management, But most of us, when we think about hospitality, we think about having friends over to our home, right? We think about uh, having uh, friends and gathering and family occasions and uh, things where we can host people and and offer them uh, food and offer them a a lovely environment. And the, the difference here is that sometimes we think of hospitality as entertaining, we get those two mixed up because hospitality is actually much, much deeper and more significant than entertaining. Now, think about when you have someone over to your house, uh, what are some of the things that you would do to prepare for someone coming to your house? You would clean, right? You got to clean the house. Maybe you would actually go and buy food that you wouldn't normally buy to have available. Maybe you would actually mow the lawn that's been neglected all winter long. Maybe, uh, whatever it is, you would set a, a, a wonderful environment. You'd light candles. You'd make sure that Alexa had a playlist ready to go. Like, you do, you do things to set a, an environment where people can come and feel comfortable. But a lot of times in our entertaining, it really is uh, more about us than it is about our guests, right? 
I mean, think about when someone's going to drop in and they say, hey, we're in the neighborhood, we're just going to drop by. Then the cleaning really starts, right? Then it's like a mad dash. The closets get filled, the under the bed gets full, and of course the bathroom is like a, a tornado. You're trying to clean the bathroom because, God forbid, they actually see how we live, right? Ew, gross. We, because we want to put out there this, this image because it reflects back on us. We're concerned about how we will look to our guests because entertaining is more about us than it is about them. There's a huge difference here. When we focus on entertaining, it, it's really about us, but hospitality is more than that. It puts the focus on the guest instead of us. It asks the question, what can we learn from them? What what can they bring to the table? What can they share? What issues are they going through that we can work through together? What can I learn from them? What can we celebrate together? It's a huge difference between hospitality and entertaining. So today, we're going to look at this because hospitality is, is not about the way we look. It's about the way we can serve people and love people, and care for people. And if that's not the heart of the gospel, I don't know what is. That is the gospel. So you see, hospitality isn't just this cute idea of having some people over and having a good time. That's wonderful. But hospitality is so much bigger. It is is a significant impact for the gospel in the kingdom of God. And all of us are invited to live lives that are hospitable to people. And so we're going to look at what that looks like this morning. So this morning, we're going to explore some of the barriers to living that out and then some of the opportunities that are before us. So first thing, one of the barriers to hospitality, one of the biggest barriers, I think, is fear. Is It's just fear. And fear is one of those things, like, I feel like every topic that we talk about in this series one of the barriers is fear, right? It's just con- one of those things that's kind of constantly an undercurrent that holds us back from what God wants to do in our lives. And it's no different for, for hospitality. You know, the, the Greek word for, uh, for hospitality is this word philomena. And it's a combination of the word love, which is philo, and stranger, which is xenos. So, the, the Greek word hospitality, it literally means love of strangers. Now that's challenging because instead of philomena, a lot of us have xenophobia. <laughs> that's the fear of strangers. And this is put in us from, from a young age, right? I mean, we talk to our kids about stranger danger, Right? I mean, we, we have to be careful because there's evil that exists in the world. Well, I get that. That's true. But we can sometimes, we can barricade ourselves off from the culture so much out of fear that we never get to engage anybody because we're scared of strangers. We're scared of what that might look like. So we, we put up our castle and we protect it with ring doorbells and video cameras and security systems. Nothing wrong with that. But I read, I read somewhere that in the last five years, the home security industry has skyrocketed to a $47 billion industry. We got a bunch of people out there that are just scared to death of everything that's outside of our four walls, that it's going to come and it's going to invade. We live with this kind of tension of fear. I found this great uh, quote. This is actually um, out of Next Door as it is in heaven. Um, but he was quoting a, a book called Radical Hospitality, a Benedict's Way of Love. And it says this, it says, Fear is a thief. It will steal our peace of mind, but it also hijacks relationships. Keeping us sealed up in our plactic world with a fragile sense of security. Being a people who fear the stranger, we have drained the life juices out of hospitality. The hospitality we explore here is not about sipping tea and making bland talk with people who live next door or work with you. 
Hospitality is a lively, courageous, and convivial way of living that challenges our compulsion either to turn away or to turn inward and disconnect ourselves from others. Wow. I mean, that is a lot of when fear dominates, our tendency is to turn inward or turn away from others so that we can protect, so that we can be safe. But hospitality is this courageous life that lives with other people and is meant to be experienced and shared with other people. What does the Bible have to say about this? Well, look in Romans chapter 12 with me, verse 12 and 13. Romans says, Rejoice in hope and be patient in suffering. Persevere in prayer. Contribute to the needs of the saints. Okay, so we contribute to one another. But then it goes on and says, Extend hospitality to strangers. I don't think stranger danger is found in the Bible anywhere. News, news flash. Hebrews 12, 2 says, Do not forget to show hospitality to strangers. For by doing, so doing, some people have shown hospitality to angels without knowing it. One more verse here. 1 John 4, 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. The context of that is that since we are recipients of Christ's love, we have experienced love and we ought to be the ones who cast fear out of other people. That's the context. Not just that we experience uh, no fear in love, but that we are the ones who should be helping cast out the fear of other people. How can we do that if we are fearful ourselves? If we're living these lives that are bound up in fear and just scared of other people all the time. We have to open ourselves up a little bit. We have to be willing to engage people who are not like us, who don't look like us, that might seem scary. We have to do that with wisdom, but we have to do it. So that's one barrier, and a big one is this fear concept. And the second barrier is busyness. Now, busyness is a challenge for all of us. I get it. In fact, I think in Southern California culture, we experience this maybe more than uh, other places in the country. We live in this fast-paced, busy society. We live with two-income families that are trying to make things work. And, and we live with kids. I've got three little kids, and life is crazy. I get it. There's realities. But simply writing off relationships because we're too busy is some scary territory to be in. That's a challenge. You guys remember the golden rule? What's the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have them do unto you, right? Now, that's more than just a, a cute phrase that your mom taught you. That's actually in the Bible. And so in Matthew, uh, originally, it's in uh, Deuteronomy 6, 5, but Jesus quotes this in the Gospels, and in Matthew 7, 12, it says, so in everything, do to others what you would have them do to you. For this sums up the law and the prophets. And then in Matthew 22, uh, 37 through 39, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind. This is the first and greatest command. And the second like it is love your neighbor as yourself. So, here, Jesus is teaching us, uh, he's affirming what has been taught throughout Scripture that the second greatest command in all of Scripture is to love your neighbor as yourself. And if you're saying that you're too busy for relationships with your neighbor, that is a scary statement. You're, you're violating, because of your schedule, the second greatest command that Jesus gave us. Wow, that's big. We've got to take stock here and say, wow, do, do I need to make some adjustments in my schedule? Do I need to take a look at, at my time? Because if we don't have time to obey Jesus' two greatest commandments, we, we need to take stock here. We say things like, man, if I had more time... I would love to foster kids. What a great opportunity that would be if I, if I had more time. If I had more time, I would host an exchange student. I would, I would invite my neighbors over to have dinner. 
I would get to know the different ethnicities in my city if, if I just had more time, if I could make time for that. But it just, it's just not there. I've had to take a look at my life too. And, you know, we all have to take stock of our, of our values because we really do have time for what we value. I have time to go camping. I have time to go explore new restaurants. I have time to watch baseball and football. I definitely have to time to drink coffee. I make a lot of time to drink coffee. I have time in my schedule to do the things that are important to me. We have time. We have all the time in the world. It's not really a time issue. But if you're too busy for gospel hospitality, that has more to do with your heart than with your schedule. And so we all have to take stock. Is this a barrier because I need to make adjustments in my heart? What's going on here? A third barrier, by the way, it doesn't get any easier. So a third, third barrier to hospitality is isolation. Now we live in a culture that is increasingly uh, living in a culture of isolation. Society is more lonely now than ever before, and this is crazy because we're more connected than ever before. We have things like social media and technology that connect us, but what it has done is isolate us. We live in virtual environments and we have virtual relationships where we define our, our friendships on the amount of likes that we get for our posts. We've done things like replace social clubs with social media. Instead of going out to be with people, we stay home and we have 15 streaming services that come into our home and entertain us. We've, we've become an isolated culture. Instead of hanging out in our, on our porch and in our front yards like they used to do, we drive into our garage and go into our houses and never see our neighbors. Our neighborhoods look like ghost towns because we never see anybody. Some of what I was writing, when I was writing this, I was sitting in Starbucks and I was looking around and I was thinking, where are the comfy chairs? Remember Starbucks comfy chairs? They're not there anymore. You know why? because they've been replaced with work tables. Instead of people sitting in a comfortable environment, having conversations and having coffee together, now you see people with laptops and headphones getting stuff done. Now, that's what I was doing there. I didn't want to have a conversation. I was getting <laughs> stuff done. But I was noticing, like, we've got a problem here. It's reflected in our society, just in, in our everyday lives. This is what it looks like now. This is one of the saddest realities of, of this isolation culture is that in the last two decades, the suicide rate has increased 56%. That's tragic. That's an epidemic. Because depression is rampant. Isolation and loneliness is rampant. I want to share with you a verse that has challenged me in this area. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. It says this, it says, No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and He will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, He will also provide a way of escape that you may be able to endure it. I love that verse. In fact, I read that verse. When I'm going through a hard time, I have leaned on that verse, that God's not going to leave me high and dry. He knows what I'm going through, and He's going to provide me the way out. But as I was thinking about this concept of isolation and hospitality, I was thinking, what if I'm the way out for someone else? What if God has put me in the life of my neighbor to be the way of escape out of their tough time? What if my gospel representation, my gospel hospitality, is that God has absolutely placed me in, a, in, in my spot, in my neighborhood, in my job, in my school, to be the way of escape for someone else, to help them to navigate life's challenges, life's storms, life's difficulties, the things we don't understand that don't make sense? What if I'm the way of escape for somebody? 
If I represent him and I, I get to live for him in this world, then surely I should have influence and impact. What if I'm the way of escape? This is an opportunity for us to extend hospitality to people who are navigating challenges in their life that don't make sense, that they don't understand, that they don't have any bedrock to, to, to fall back on. You're the answer. You're the answer. So isolation is this, is this barrier that we've got to break through and see ourselves as the answer. So that means that we can't be isolated ourselves, right? We have to be engaging people so that we can be the answer for people. So we live in this world where there's these barriers that we, have to, we just have to wrestle with and see, like, is there something that I have to break through here? But there's some great opportunities for us for hospitality as well. And so I want to look at some of those, uh, those opportunities. And so I'm going to start by reading the parable of the Good Samaritan. So the, uh, let me just set this up for you for a minute. So this is recorded in Luke chapter 10. And Jesus is teaching the crowds, and there's this lawyer that stands up and starts asking questions like, like a lawyer would, right? So anytime the lawyer stands up to ask questions, it's like, oh boy, here we go. So, so he stands up and he's questioning Jesus, and he says, what shall we do to inherit eternal life? So he wants the... The, the law. He wants, what do I have to fulfill to get this thing that you're talking about? And so Jesus replies with a question, which he often did. He said, what is written in the law? And this lawyer, he answers, he says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your, love your neighbor as yourself. We just, we just read that. So he knew that. He, he knew that he's supposed to love people and love God with all of his heart. But he's not getting it here. Like, that wasn't enough for him, right? Jesus is kind of like, well, that's your answer. But he's, he pushes further and he says, but who is my neighbor? And so Jesus tells this story to him to demonstrate who his neighbor is. So let's, let's read this story. So Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a priest was going down the road, and when he saw him, he passed on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came uh, to the place and saw him, he passed on the other side. But the Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him, and with, he bound up his wounds, pouring oil and wine then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper saying, take care of him and whatever more you spend, I will repay when I come back. Which of these three, Jesus asked, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? And he, the, the lawyer, said, the one who showed him mercy and Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Now there's some, there's some huge significance in the characters here of the story because the first two guys are these religious holy men. So you have a priest and then you have a Levite. These were the holy men. These were the people that anyone who was hearing this story, they would expect, okay, those are the guys that surely they would go out of their way to help this guy who's lying, lying on the side of the road half dead, beaten, and stripped naked. I mean, how can you pass by that? But these holy men, they actually skirt around him. They avoid that situation. They intentionally go the opposite direction. That's not an accident. That was something that they noticed and chose to neglect. And then the other significant thing here is that it's a Samaritan that stops. Now, in their culture, Samaritans were looked down upon. So no one would expect that the Samaritan, the least likely person, would actually be the one to stop and to see this guy and to help him. The first point here, the opportunity of, of hospitality is simply to love people. It's to see people first and to love them, to have the, the, the passage here says that 
he, the Samaritan had compassion. He saw him and his heart went out. He, he loved this person. He didn't even know them. 1 John 4, 11 says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. I love this about, about God's stance towards love is that everybody gets God's love. No one's exempt. Every, his love is open and non-discriminating. As, as, as followers of Jesus, we, got, we, we have opportunity to love people and show them the gospel through our love, and that extends to everybody, to anybody that God puts in our path. The sad reality is, is that sometimes that's difficult, and we would rather, it would just feel safer, it feels more comfortable, sometimes even more prudent, to skirt around it. Somebody else will deal with that. That's a little too messy. Or, or I've got this other stuff that I'm doing. Or I'm too busy. But the gospel hospitality sees people and goes to people and cares for people. I saw, I read a, 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 a modern day example of this. Uh, there was a, CNN was doing uh, a piece on the homeless uh, crisis in LA. And so they interviewed uh, this guy named Sean Pleasance. And this, uh, this man, Sean, he was his high school valedictorian, and he moved on from high school and went to Yale and graduated Yale, from Yale. And this Ivy Leaguer, he went and worked on Wall Street, but he became um, depressed and he turned to drugs, and his life just totally spiraled downwards until the point that he found himself homeless on the streets of L.A.'s uh, Koreatown. And there was a woman who was reading this CNN article. Her name was Ken Hirschman, uh, Kim, Kim Hirschman. And she read this and she was shocked because she went to Yale with this guy. She recognized him and she said, how can this be? And so uh, Kim Hirschman, she went down to, uh, to Koreatown and she hunted this guy down. And I, I love what she says in, in this little story that I read about her. She said, I was, uh, I was a little nervous because I was like, where am I going? I'm a five foot one female fearing that she might not be safe in Koreatown. She's like, I got to go find this guy and I'm scared to do it, but I can't let this be. And so she goes down and she found this guy and Long story short, she garnered support from other Ivy League graduates and uh, other community members, and she found a guest house to put this guy up in and get him off the streets. She found medical care to help him with the one eye that was going blind. She found a rehab clinic for him and got him clean. She changed this guy's world. Why? Because she said, that's not just the mess for somebody else. It was personal. And I think we've got a huge opportunity for the gospel when we would just say, this is personal. Loving people is going to be personal to me. It's just going out of our way to show people kindness. And yeah, it can be inconvenient. Yeah, it can be costly. For the Samaritan, it was inconvenient. He didn't get to ride his horse all the way into town. He had to walk because he put that guy on his horse. It was costly because when he got to the inn, he actually paid for the innkeeper to, to mend this guy and give him food and, and give him a place to be. It was costly. Caring for people will cost us. Loving people will cost us. But Jesus went to a lot of cost to love us. He gave his life. The least we can do is to love people and care for them. Here's some basic, just some basic ways that we can love people with hospitality. You can care about the stuff that your neighbors care about. I mean, even if you don't care about it, just pretend that you care about it. <laughs> you can show interest in the stuff that your neighbors are interested in. Our, in our little condo complex, uh, we live in a very pet-friendly, I would say like hyper-pet-focused little complex. We have some pet lovers. So I, I'm just, I will admit this, 
I am a, the worst pet owner, okay? Like when next door is blowing up with like, hey, there's coyotes that are coming down from the mountains. We're like, open the door. Okay, kitty, out, out you go. Out you go. I know, don't report me. I'm sorry. I'm just not a good pet owner. I admit it. But our complex, they love animals. And so we're out there petting dogs, getting to know their names, and loving our neighbors because that's what they care about. What does your neighborhood care about? Care about that stuff. Maybe it's fixing up old cars or, or fixing houses or, I, I don't know, make, baking stuff. Whatever it is, care about that stuff just so you can get into the lives of people and love them. Here's some other ideas for you, just practical ways to love people with hospitality. Invite other people into the stuff you like to do, into the regular routines of your life. This doesn't have to be hard. You don't have to like set aside a whole bunch of extra time. Just, just invite people into the stuff you already do. Make them welcome. Here's another practical thing. Care about the older generation. This is a segment of society that is one of the loneliest groups of people. Older people. So go out of your way to just show love for the elderly people in your neighborhood, the people that you come across. And by the way, that extends to the younger generation too. Don't get annoyed with the, with the noise and the ruckus and the playing. Go love those kids. Go show them the gospel and demonstrate the, the gospel to the next generation. That's an opportunity to love people. So we've got a great opportunity for hospitality in just loving people and showing them love. Here's a, here's a second opportunity for hospitality. It's to live unhurried. Now, we talked about living a busy life, and this is a, this is a challenge for us. It's a, it's a value statement for us, and it's hard. But, but again, the Samaritan's example, he slowed down enough to stop and to see. Can we just stop there for a second? He stopped and he saw a person. He saw a need. I think some of us are so busy sometimes, it's hard to even slow down long enough to see those around us. I'm right now, I'm, uh, as Denise and I get ready to plant Canvas Church in Camarillo, we're excited to be, to be building that and heading that direction. Um, I have been walking the city streets of Camarillo. And my goal is to walk every city street in the, in the city and just to pray for the city and get to know it. And it's amazing what happens as I'm walking. I'm getting to see the values of a community. I'm getting to see some of the dysfunctions of a community. You get to know something intimately when you just slow down to observe and to see what's around you. And sometimes we, we just need to take a step back for a minute. This guy, this, this poor man, was, was, he, he took the time to bind up his wounds. That, do you realize that means that he probably took his cloak off or his, clo his own clothes off to bind this guy's wounds and to take care of him? He lived unhurried and, un, and, and inconvenienced. Gospel hospitality is never, never, never convenient. It requires time, but, but time is a, is a fleeting thing, isn't it? And so, so what we often do to maximize our time and, and maximize our hospitality is that we will do event hospitality. So we will we'll say, I'm going to open my home um, and I'm going to throw an event. And that could be awesome. That's a great opportunity. Invite your neighbors in and invite, invite people in. But we create an event out of it so that it's controllable and, it is a, and it's definable so that we have it in a compartment where we can say, I'm hospitable over here and I've done that so I can live for myself in all these other ways. But real hospitality is living a life that's just open to people, that's always inviting people in and to be a part of it. We don't marginalize our hospitality to a compartment and then we're done. It, it's part of who we are. It's part of our lifestyle. It's how we live and breathe. It's how the gospel gets extended to other people. 
Because here's the thing, when, when we have only event hospitality, our relationships with people are just transactional because they happen in a defined space and then we're done with it and we move on. And those relationships get left over there instead of being a part of all that we are. So they get to see a picture of us when we're entertaining and putting out our best, but they don't get to see the authentic lives of us dealing with real life issues and stuff. And then they don't get to see God working in the middle of that. They need to have access to all of our lives. The other thing is that the Holy Spirit doesn't work on our time frame. So you might have your your scheduled time over here for hospitality, but guess what? When you go to the grocery store, God had a, uh, an appointment for you to meet with someone, and he's going to speak to you and say, I want you to reach into that person's life. So we've got to live unhurried enough that we can engage this. I feel like, um, I feel like John, Pastor John always gets to brag on his dad for the great example that he set. So I have a dad story this morning, and my dad's actually here. So I'm going to brag on Tony Looney a little bit this morning. So a <coughs> so the, the great example of this, when um, I wasn't even born yet, but when, when my parents, um, when, when they were young and my mom was pregnant with my sister, my dad owned a, a mobile bookstore, and he took it to the fair, the county fair, and was selling books. And one night as he packed up his stuff and, and headed home, um, he was on his way out of the fair and there was a guy thumbing a ride, hitchhiking. And the Lord spoke to my dad and just said, pick this guy up. And so he did. He, he pulled over, he picked this guy up, this stranger. And so he said, oh, I'm headed east uh, or I'm headed south. If you want to go south with me, I'll take you as far as I'm going. Um, and so he said, that sounds great. And so my dad starts driving and he drives to south to where he has to turn off to go east. And he said, okay, well, you know, we're, I'm going to turn off and go the other way now, go east. So if you want to get off, and the guy's like, no, it's okay, I'll, I'll ride along. And so my dad's thinking like, okay, like, how far is this guy going to ride? And so it's like seven miles to their house. And so my dad has seven miles of conversation with this guy and seven miles to hear the voice of the Holy Spirit tell him, bring this guy home with you. Now, this guy, his name was Larry. Larry was a carny. My dad's bringing a carny home from the fair to, my, to his pregnant wife, who has no idea because cell phones don't exist yet. I wonder what that conversation was like as he walked in the door with this stranger. But he brings this guy home. My mom cooks him dinner and he starts to tell his story that he had gone through a divorce and he was just lost in life. And so he had gone and the fair was hiring day workers to, to work at the fair. And so he, he went and he was working in the midway as a carny and they were cheating people in the games. And so he was st standing up to them and, and trying to not cheat and not do things they were doing. And he said to them that he was leaving because he was afraid that that night he might actually get a knife because he, there was a lot of contention and he was actually scared for his life. And so he was like, you guys sh uh, saved my life. So they gave him a bed uh, to sleep in. The next day he goes out with my dad on his way back out to the fair. My dad drops him off. And long story short, this guy goes on. He got remarried. They went to a, a church together, and he, they, he stayed in touch with our family. And I have met this guy multiple times, even though I wasn't alive when that happened, because it made such an impact in his life that he came back and said, I've come to Jesus. I've given my life to Jesus, but it really started in your home. When you showed me hospitality to a stranger a guy who was scary, who could have been a murderer, you didn't know, you welcomed me into your home. Now, we have to act in wisdom. I'm sure the Holy Spirit had to speak loud and clear to bring that a stranger into your home, but we have opportunities when we live an unhurried life to hear the Holy Spirit and to be able to respond. Because here's what I know, if, we, if we're just rushing through life a million miles an hour, we would never hear that call. We would never respond to something that audacious, that crazy. But the Lord had that appointment set up for my, my family. 
to make an influence that would be eternal in that man's life. So we have this opportunity when we live unhurried lives to demonstrate the gospel to people. The last thing here that I want to bring up as an opportunity for hospitality is that we have the opportunity to bring shalom into this world. Let me just kind of describe this concept of shalom. Shalom is a Hebrew word, so it sounds kind of awkward to us, but it's a word that means, the meaning of this is rest, peace, prosperity, wholeness, and flourishing. So it's one word that encompasses all of this, rest, peace, prosperity, wholeness, and flourishing. And so we have the opportunity to represent that, all of that peace and that wholeness and that prosperity in our neighborhoods, in the place where God has planted us. We find this concept of shalom and God's people being people of shalom all over Scripture. Let me give you one example. In Jeremiah 29, uh, 4 through 7, let me read this. So first of all, this is Jeremiah's instructions to the Jewish people that are living um, as slaves in Babylon, okay? They've been removed from Jerusalem. It says, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there, do not increase, or do not decrease, excuse me. So pause there for a second. So, so he's saying, first of all, flourish as a community, okay? Where even though you're exiles, even though you're slaves, right where you're at, flourish, be together and live, uh, live in wholeness together. But then he goes way further. He says, also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city of, to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. See, he's saying, don't just buy time until Jesus comes to save the day. Be present, because you have been placed there. You have been sent there for a purpose. You have been sent to make an impact into the neighborhood. It's not just about your own flourishing. You're supposed to pray for your enemy that they would flourish, that you would be able to be the gospel representation in a dark world, in a place that needs light. And so we as God's people, we're these little pockets of shalom all over our city. We're the pockets of people that get to help, help bring prosperity and wholeness and flourishing to a neighborhood that is dark and lonely and needs answers. We get to bring shalom. Now, this is the gospel. This is what Jesus did when he came and took on flesh. We know it as the, it's called the incarnation. He, he came to be among us and to show us how to live. He was shalom to us. And now we get to extend it to others. I love how um, uh, John 1, 14, I love how it says, and the word became flesh. And dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Lance Ford in Next Door as it is in heaven, he interprets this verse, this the word became flesh. His interpretation is Jesus came out on the lawn to talk with us. Jesus opened up the garage door so we could have a conversation. I love that. Jesus made himself accessible to us so that we could experience a touch of heaven, a touch of his peace and his hope and his flourishing. I wonder if we would make more time to open our garage doors and spend time on our front porches if we would have the opportunity to be shalom to people. We have a great opportunity before us. Proverbs 12, 26 says, The one who is righteous is a guide to his neighbor, but the way of the wicked leads him astray. 
See, I just want us to, to pause for a moment and realize hospitality is so much more than having some friends over and enjoying some time together. It's more than a cute little idea of hanging out. It is a gospel responsibility for us to represent the fullness of God to other people. And the way that we do that is to slow down, maybe rearrange some things in our schedules so that we can open our lives to people. Now, we have to start wherever we're at. And I love this about about Jesus. He doesn't ever ask us to get all of our lives together before we can represent him. He just asks us to start right where we're at. So whatever you have, wherever you're at, whatever you know, maybe you just met Jesus last week or this morning, or maybe you've known him for years and years, that's okay. Hospitality is being open to people, loving people, and sharing with them whatever you know about Jesus with whatever they're hungry for to know about him. Just love people and be in their lives. You don't have to know all of the theological answers. You don't have to have your life together and perfect. Just be authentic, be real, and welcome people into the mess of your life. And let them see Jesus. So we need God's heart for people. We need God's heart of hospitality to love and care and serve those around us. Again, the typical response society's response to this is to barricade our lives, to keep the evil out. Or for some of us, one of the the difficulties is we'll take the moral high ground, like the priest and the Levite. Like we're we're so holy, we can't, we don't, we don't, we're we're too lofty to deal with that mess. We don't want to get touched by the, the evil over there. Or the the fear factor that Fear is prudent, and what if, what will happen, what, what could it mean? Or we, we'll say, like, not on my watch, that's, that's an issue, and we'll take, we'll take people's needs up as an issue, and we'll advocate for an issue, but we never actually meet the person and build the relationship with people to meet their need. So we do all these, like, typical responses where we say, maybe sometimes, Maybe, maybe I'll be able to engage that at some point in my life, or maybe I'll give a one compartment to that. And we neglect what the Holy Spirit is doing throughout our whole lives. But as, as a response to that, and instead of that, I'd like us to ask, ask ourselves some hard questions to say, how, how could I be Christ's hope and love and care for people? What would it look like for me to start and start now with what I have? How can I be honest with people about my shortcomings? Where can I, where can I serve people? How could I give my time? How could I care more about people than my stuff? These are some big questions. But I believe that God wants to give us his heart for people because he wants us to engage and he's called us to engage, and he's placed us in opportunities to engage. And all he's doing is waiting for us to answer. Let's pray this morning that God would help us. The Lord Jesus, these are challenging things. But Lord God, we know that the gospel shapes our lives in a way that impacts those around us. And so, Lord, I thank you for the opportunities, the fun that it is to engage people, to love people and to care for them, to walk with them. Lord, it's fun to see your your truth break through the lies and the barriers that people experience. It's a joy. And so, God, I pray that you would challenge us this morning to think differently, to approach differently, that we would get uncluttered and, and unhindered in our approach to people so that we can love and care and demonstrate that to other people. God, challenge us and move us forward. In Jesus' name I pray.